This morning's reading is from John chapter 11. If you can all find it in your Bibles. John chapter 11. John chapter 11 verse 1 reads, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will not get if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. Let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask for. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. This is the reading of God's word. Thank you, Ruby, very much indeed, and a very good morning to you. Uh, It's lovely to have you all with us again this morning. Um, Obviously, with the events in Ukraine this past week, um, we're all going to be praying about that. And we have our monthly prayer meeting this coming Wednesday. Um, I do hope you'll all tune into that. Uh, It's over Zoom, and obviously we'll be giving special attention to what's been happening there this past week. But now let's have our Bibles open. If you don't have a Bible and would like one, please raise your hand and uh, someone will bring it to you. But uh, I'm going to begin by praying and asking for the Lord's help. Well, our loving Heavenly Father, we know that your word is light for the path and food for our souls and strength for the weary, comfort and challenge. 
And we pray that as we study your word this morning, that you would speak to us in a personal, helpful, and special way, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you were with us on our annual Vision Day, which was earlier this month, you'll remember that one of our objectives here at St. Barnabas is to grow as a community of worshippers. Uh, we want worship to be at the heart of everything that we do as a church family. And to help us with that each month through the year, uh, we're learning a new song together. And actually for the last couple of months, the song we've been learning is the one that we sang just before the Bible reading, It Is Well With My Soul. Uh, I know some of you know, but in case you don't, that song was written by a man called Horatio Spafford. Uh, and he wrote it in just about the most distressing circumstances imaginable. Um, his family had planned a trip to Europe so uh, Horatio put his wife and four daughters on a, a luxury cruise liner sailing out of New York for France. Uh, he personally had some business to finish in Chicago before he could join them, and he was hoping to join the family later. The, the journey on this luxury ship started well, but on the evening of November the 21st, 1873, uh, their ship was hit by another vessel, and in just 30 minutes, it sank. All four of Horatio Spafford's daughters drowned, and only his wife survived. Now, if you're a Christian, uh, how do you deal with something like that? Uh, do you shake your fist at God that he would allow something as terrible as that into your life? Do you stop believing that God is good? Do you stop believing that God is always in control? What do you do? Well, uh, a few months after the tragedy, Horatio Spafford responded by writing the famous words we sang a few moments ago. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So you lose four children, in a matter of minutes they're dead, but in spite of that, you sing, it is well with my soul. Could you do that? Could I do that? I mean, if God allows something as massive as that into our lives, would we hold on to the Christian hope that Jesus is Lord of absolutely everything in our lives, including death? Now, friends, this is where John chapter 11 is such a tremendous help to us because it's a great faith builder. It prepares us to face the really painful things that are an unavoidable part of life in a fallen world. And because of the importance of this chapter, we're going to be looking at it over two Sunday mornings. So next Sunday morning, God willing, Richard Cunningham will be back with us again and will take us through the second half of the chapter where Jesus raises a man who's already been dead for several days. But this morning, what I want to do is to highlight four elements in the first half of the chapter that show us, I think, how faith in Jesus Christ works in the really dark times in our lives. And the first of these is this. It is the need that led to prayer. The need that led to prayer. And we're looking here at verses 1 to 3. Now, all of us here this morning uh, find ourselves in situations of real need from time to time. That need might be financial, uh, it might be medical, it might be emotional, 
might be intellectual. Whatever it is, when it comes, the question is, what are you going to do with it? Well, the passage begins, doesn't it, with a need which is described for us in verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. Now, Lazarus belonged to a family that the Lord Jesus knew very well. Uh, The Gospel writer Luke tells us that Jesus was actually a regular visitor to the home of Lazarus and his sisters. And here, the sisters do what every Christian should do in times of trouble. Verse 3, they sent a message to Jesus. Or as we would say, they prayed. Lord, the one you love is sick. So their need led them to pray, and immediately there's an important lesson for us. Because for every Christian, any need that leads us to pray is already a potential blessing. I wonder if you think about your needs like that. That any need that leads you to pray is actually a potential blessing. I think if we can learn that lesson this morning, it'll transform the way that we look at life. See, I think that most of us tend to look at our needs as a cosmic mistake. When something goes wrong uh, and we find ourselves facing a crisis of some kind, we imagine, don't we, that God has forgotten about us or that he's giving his attention to somebody else somewhere else in his universe. And our our instinct, I think, is to rush off and look for a human solution to the problem. So we don't pray, or at least we don't pray until much later. But friends, we need to learn that all of our needs, both big and small, are never outside God's sovereign control. So we are to pray. And the first lesson I think that we learn from Martha and Mary is that prayer is opening the door of our need to the limitless resources of the Lord Jesus. Elsewhere, the New Testament reminds us that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. In all things great and small, and that includes our times of need. So, friends, not to pray in times of need is, at the very least, unwise and might actually be really rather foolish. But there's something else for us here. Will you notice that the the sister's prayer is just a very simple summary of the problem? Lord, the one you love is sick. Notice that there's no demand that Jesus come immediately. They don't actually even ask Jesus to heal their brother. Surely that's what they want, but they don't demand it. Now, can I suggest that sometimes you and I delay praying until we've kind of analyzed the problem from every single angle, and then when we do eventually get around to praying... Uh, we present God with our preferred solution and ask him to please get on with it. Now, friends, that is not the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith recognizes that Jesus is in control. A friend of mine puts it rather brilliantly when he says, quote, the prayer of faith simply lays out the need to Jesus on the ground of his love and leaves the outcome to him. Now that is absolutely right. True faith trusts the love of Jesus, that he wants only the very best for us, and he knows the best solution far better than I do. So that's the first thing this morning, the need that led to prayer. Then the second thing I think to notice is the love that led to delay. 
the love that led to delay. And here we're in verses 4 through to 16. I don't know whether you noticed this, but I was rather struck in the passage by the way that Mary and Martha describe their brother as the one you love. You see, they could have said, couldn't they, Lazarus is sick. But they identified him to Jesus as the one you love. That's very interesting to me because we don't actually know very much about Lazarus. In fact, apart from this one incident, he doesn't feature anywhere else in the gospel record. So the fact that his sisters can describe him in this particular way, I think suggests the rather attractive possibility that Jesus had a number of very close relationships with people that we know absolutely nothing about. But far more importantly, uh, this love of Jesus for Lazarus is also a way of understanding and thinking about the experience of every Christian today. You know, as believers, uh, we don't normally think of ourselves as those who love Jesus and are really rather good at it. No, we usually think of ourselves as those who are loved by him. So, for example, John, who wrote this particular gospel, describes himself in several places as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And uh, later on in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul, that, that giant intellect who we might expect to describe his relationship with the Lord in rather academic language, says, I know I'm a Christian because Jesus loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. So friends, let me remind you that being a Christian is a matter of knowing that I am loved by Jesus. Do you know that this morning? I hope you do. If you've experienced the new birth, then you will know in your heart that Jesus loves you. Now that is really, really important. And I'll say more about it in a moment. But first, there seems to be a problem, doesn't there? The fact that Jesus loves Lazarus leaves us totally unprepared for the way that Jesus responds to the message from the sisters. I mean, think about it for a moment. If you get a message on your cell phone that uh, one of your children or grandchildren has been taken sick at school, what do you do? You drop everything, you rush to school straight away, you pick them up and take them to the doctor. Isn't that right? Well, we would expect Jesus, wouldn't we, to respond to the news about Lazarus in the same way. But look again at verse 5. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now, friends, that doesn't seem to make any sense, does it? The delay seems to suggest that Jesus doesn't actually care at all. But you and I need to learn that when God delays, in answering our prayers it is not a sign of any lack of love towards us no the delay means that he's got something better for us and you see we need to hang on to that don't we when our prayers are not answered immediately Jesus loved Martha and Mary but he stayed where he was two more days now why? What was the purpose of the delay? Verse 11. Jesus went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, so that you may believe. So can you see that the purpose of the delay 
was that the disciples might believe. But what actually did Jesus want them to believe? Well, he wanted them to know this, that Jesus transforms death into sleep. You see, because he loves them, Jesus is going to give them a wonderful demonstration of the fact that for all who trust in Jesus, death is falling asleep in this world and waking up in the presence of Almighty God. Now, do you believe that? One of the uh, most important differences between the Christian and uh, everybody else is that the Christian has a totally different and distinctive view and attitude towards death. Let me give you a little contrast to illustrate the point. First, the unbeliever. Some of you will have heard of uh, the comedian Woody Allen. Uh, he made a fortune out of films and so on by making people laugh. Some would say that he was a comic genius. But like so many comedians, he actually had a rather dark and melancholic side to his character. And it would seem that one of the main reasons for that was his terror in the face of death. So on one occasion, Woody Allen said this, and I quote, the fundamental thing behind all motivation and all activity is the constant struggle against annihilation and death. It is absolutely stupefying in its terror, and it renders anyone's accomplishments meaningless, end quote. So have you got the picture? The atheist comes face to face with death, and he's, he's ignorant of what lies ahead, and so he recoils in terror from it. Now, by contrast, let's look at an example from the early church. Keep a finger in John chapter 11 and turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Now, this is the, the Christian attitude to death. 1 Thessalonians... Chapter 4, verse 13. Are we all there? <clears throat> Paul says this. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, you couldn't have a greater contrast than that, could you? For the Christian facing death, instead of terror, there's confidence that the moment they die, God will bring them straight into the presence of Jesus. Now, the pandemic, of course, brought death very close to home, didn't it? And uh, for some of you, grief and mourning were never very far away. But friends, can you see that the way that we grieve for Christians who have died is fundamentally different to the way that we grieve for those who don't belong to Jesus? And in John chapter 11, Jesus delays so that the people he loves and cares about will see the proof the proof that Jesus transforms death to sleep. The love that led to delay. Then thirdly, in our passage, we find the grief that led to hope. The grief that led to hope, verses 17 to 22. Now, when uh, Jesus arrives, uh, Lazarus has already been in the tomb four days. John tells us that twice, doesn't he? Uh, once in verse 17, and then a bit later in the chapter, which we didn't read, in verse 39. So it must be important. Why does John do that? Well, in those days, there was a Jewish superstition that when you die, your spirit kind of 
hovers over the body for three days, looking for a way back into the corpse. But after three days, so the superstition went, it departs. And from that moment on, resuscitation is impossible. So Jesus arrives, you see, when there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Lazarus is dead. Martha and Mary are in mourning, and uh, many friends have come to comfort them from Jerusalem. But John turns the spotlight onto Martha. And that's very interesting because over the years, Martha has had a rather bad press. Uh, in Luke's Gospel, you'll remember that it's Mary who's sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to the marvelous teaching, while Martha is stuck in the kitchen getting very bad tempered because Mary's not helping her with the washing up. And for that reason, I think Christians over the years have tended to uh, write Martha off as being rather less spiritual than her sister. But you see, that's because they haven't read this passage very carefully. Because here, although Martha is grieving, there's a wonderful maturity about it. So she hears that Jesus is on the way, and in verse 21, if you look at it, she goes to Jesus and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, yes, there are one or two commentators that say that uh, what she meant was, um, if only you had answered our message straight away, this wouldn't have happened. So they're saying that she was complaining. But I want to suggest to you that can't possibly be right, because it doesn't fit at all with what follows. Now, I think she is simply hanging on to what she knows about Jesus and what she knows to be true about him. Because she knows that in the presence of Jesus, death is impossible. Now, if you go and read the four Gospels this afternoon, you will find there is never a time when someone dies in the presence of Jesus. Not once. Now, Martha's faith might not be perfect. Uh, she's got no idea what Jesus is about to do. And immediately before the miracle, she warns Jesus uh, not to remove the stone from across the grave because of the smell of decomposition. So Martha's still got lots to learn. But she knows from her own experience that she can trust Jesus. And that's why she says, verse 22, I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And you see, her faith, simple and imperfect as it might be, is rewarded with the most important revelation Jesus ever gave about himself. Now, we can all learn something really, really important from Martha. Because Martha reminds us that Jesus does not answer our prayers in proportion to our faith. You know, Jesus never says, because you've only got a 30% faith, I'm only going to give you a 30% answer. The extent of our faith is not the issue. Elsewhere, you remember, Jesus says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from there to, to here to there, and it will move. Now, that is a picture, isn't it, of a disproportionate relationship. You can't have anything much smaller than a mustard seed. You can't have anything much bigger than a mountain. And the point is, you see, that what counts is not our big faith. No, no. What counts is faith in a big God. And Martha knows that God listens to Jesus and will give him whatever he asks for. Now, of course, at this point, she's got no idea exactly what that will be. But in the midst of her grief, she discovers a fresh hope in Jesus, a hope that is actually bigger than the agony of her loss. And her hope is rewarded, isn't it, in the most wonderful way. 
the grief that led to hope. And that brings us lastly to the faith that led to life. The faith that led to life, verses 23 to 27. Now some of you will know that it is only in the Gospel of John that we find these seven I am statements of the Lord Jesus through which Jesus is identifying himself as the big I am of the Bible. And uh, in verse 25, we've got the fifth and the, the most wonderful of all of them. It's the saying that explains the remarkable miracle that we're going to be looking at uh, next Sunday morning with Richard Cunningham. So in verse 25, uh, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, if you knew, knew nothing else about the rest of the Bible and John chapter 11, was the first thing that you read, you might be rather shocked by the conversation. You know, there's Martha. Uh, she's grieving the loss of her brother. And Jesus responds by talking about himself. Now, can I tell you that that breaks all of the rules in every bereavement counseling manual? In bereavement counselling, what you're supposed to do is to listen and to offer whatever practical support you can. The one thing you are never, never, never to do is talk about yourself. But of course, even the most um, basic knowledge of the rest of the Bible tells us that what Jesus says here is actually the most important thing that he can say to anybody. Because what Jesus is saying to Martha is this. Martha, you believe, don't you, that at the end of the age, there is a day appointed by Almighty God when the Messiah will come and raise all his people to life, millions of them. He'll raise them from the grave and he'll clothe them with new bodies. Do you believe that, Martha? And Martha says... Yes, I do, verse 24. And in verse 25, what Jesus is saying is this. Well, Messiah is here. It's me. And what you are about to witness is a trailer. It's a foretaste. It's an anticipation of that great day at the end of the age. And I want you to be so absolutely gripped by what you're about to see, that it will prepare you for that day and you will be excited about it and you will look forward to it. And what I'm going to do for Lazarus, I'm going to do for you because I love you. You see, what Jesus is, is actually saying here is I am exactly and precisely what Lazarus needs at this moment. Why? Because, verse 25, please look at it. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. That's why I'm exactly what Lazarus needs at the moment. And I'm also exactly what you need, Martha. Why? Verse 26. Because... Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. In other words, Martha, there is never going to be so much as a millisecond when you are separated from my saving, loving fellowship. Now, is that not an amazing promise? You see, what it means is that when we see the corpse of a loved one, we aren't seeing the full reality. It looks like death to us. It looks horrible. 
It looks final, but it is not the whole story. Because Jesus promises here that if they are his sheep, if they believed in him while they yet lived, then even though their earthly bodies have shut down, they themselves did not taste death. John chapter 5. They were never separated from the saving presence of Jesus, not even for a moment. Why? Because he already gave them eternal life when they believed. And eternal life, it's not just jargon. What does eternal life mean? It means life without interruption. That's what it means. So what is the appropriate response to these astonishing promises of the Lord Jesus? Well, Martha shows us, doesn't she? Verse 27. When Jesus asks her, do you believe this? She replies, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Now, my question for you this morning is, what about you? Do you believe this? Can you say to Jesus, I believe you are my resurrection and my life? Because, you see, if you can, you need have no fear of death. Some of you will have heard of Tim Keller, who for many years has been the pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. And in 2020, Tim Keller was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, He inevitably had the radiation and the chemotherapy for months and months and months, but sadly, the cancer has progressed to stage four. So Tim Keller's been thinking a lot about death, and so much so, in fact, he's just written a book about it. And uh, there's a place in the book where he explains how we as Christians should think about death, and I hope this is going to appear on the screen. This is what he says, quote, Rather than living in fear of death, we should see death as spiritual smelling salts that will awaken us out of our false belief that we will live forever. When you are at a funeral, especially one for a friend or a loved one, Listen to God speaking to you, telling you everything in life, in this life, is temporary except for his love. That is the reality. Now, friends, that is exactly right. And as you and I reflect on this marvelous chapter in the coming week, let's fix our minds on the reality that if we are Christians, there will never, never be a moment in time or eternity when we are cut off from God's love. Everything else in life is temporary, but for the Christian, our experience of God's love is permanent. It'll last forever. And you see, if you know that, if we are secure in God's love, then we've got everything that we need to face even the darkest moments in our lives. Do you believe that? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we we thank you for showing us the very core of the good news. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So as we come now to your table, 
please engrave these wonderful words on our hearts and minds and help us to live day by day, moment by moment, in the good of them and especially in the darkest times. For it is in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you for listening to this resource from St. Barnabas Bible Church. For more sermons, visit our sermon library over at sbbc.org.za forward slash sermons. St. Barnabas Bible Church exists to help people find meaning and mission in following Jesus. If you would like to give towards this ministry, here are some ways you can do so.